Hello people and welcome to Is A Recording. I'm your host Kyle Duffy and on this podcast I talk movies and TV. On today's episode I'm very pleased to be joined by two special guests who will be helping me review the movie Barbie which has just broken box office records and is the first movie to amass one billion in the box office which is directed by a solo female director. So you can look forward to that. I'm also going to be talking a bit about the SAG and WAG actors and writer strike, which is happening in Hollywood at the moment. All this to look forward to on this episode. So sit back and enjoy because Is A Recording is back. Before I'm joined by my first guest to review Barbie, I just wanted to touch on the SAG actor and writer strike. It's still ongoing in Hollywood at the moment, and if you've seen it online, if you've seen it on TV, and you don't exactly know why the strike is happening, I just wanted to give you an overview of it at the moment. I actually talked about this on my movie segment on CRC FM not too long ago at the start of August, and I just wanted to talk about it on here as well. It's a real shame what's happening because if you have a particular movie you're looking forward to or a series of a TV show that you're looking forward to returning to your streaming platform, it could be a while before that happens. There are several movies and TV shows that have stopped production and shut down completely out of respect for the writers and the actors going through this strike right now. Again, just to give you an overview, looking at who is involved here. There's a two-pronged system here. Okay, first of all, the writers. Why are they striking, you may ask? Well, to put it plain and simply, all they're looking for are fair wages. They're overworked and underpaid, as I mentioned. Most of these writers are living below the poverty line and working paycheck to paycheck. People have this perception of Hollywood. And they just think because people are working in Hollywood, they're living like Hollywood superstars. Writers do not live like the high-paid actors. No writer starting out or even, you know, in the middle of their career are able to live a life of luxury like Tom Cruise, like Adam Sandler, like David Spade, like all these superstars. This is the reality for them. You know, we look at actors and writers who are starting off. They have to work multiple jobs because this is still a project for them. This is still a passion project and it's not their main source of income. And in researching this topic, because I did talk about it on CRC FM in my movie segment, I came across an interview of a writer who worked on the hit TV show The Bear, which has released its second season, and I'm almost all the way through. I think I finished episode 9 last night. But he mentioned working on that show and how he was treated so badly by the executives of the streaming system, or the streaming platform that The Bear is run on, and the executives of the studios. They don't care about these writers and the wages they are being paid. And that's what they're looking for. They're looking for fair wages, which is not an unreasonable request. You know, if you put in the work, you deserve to get paid. And like I said, there is this perception, this misguided perception, that because you're in Hollywood, you can't complain. You're getting paid hand over foot. You're overpaid, in a sense. These writers, a lot of them living below the poverty line. And this is why... Many people don't make it in Hollywood because the system is set up for them to fail. That's why they have second jobs in place. That's why they have backup plans and why they don't quit their job when they do get that first role, when they do get that first slot on a TV show as a writer, as an actor. You know, just to use an example, one of my favorite actors, one of my favorite TV shows, John Krasinski, who plays Jim on The Office, he mentioned that when he started on The Office... He was a week away from quitting showbiz altogether before he got the call for the office. He made a deal with his mother and he said this He said this in an interview when he came off season 9 of The Office and when he was like a bona fide superstar at that time and he had just gotten into action movies and was looking at maybe writing, directing. I think this was, this was before he actually previewed his directorial debut with The Quiet Place. He was talking around his career and how it blossomed and how it actually, you know, that match got struck. And he said, I made a deal with my mother. I came out here to Los Angeles to pursue this career. 
But when I left, she said, you can't ask me to make you quit. You can't ask me to bring you home. You have to make that decision for yourself. So give yourself a period of two years. Try to achieve what you want to achieve. Go for your goals. Reach for the stars. And if it looks like it's not happening, pull yourself back. Because I can't be the one to pull you back. I can't take your dreams away from you like that. To be honest, she's a very progressive woman to think that way. And in my opinion, a great mother for actually realizing, okay, I can't be the one to rip my son's dreams away from him. He has to be willing to accept that this is not going to happen. It came up to that two-year mark, he said, and I was approaching the two years, the two-year anniversary of being in Hollywood, of working in LA and not getting anywhere. He said that he was bussing tables, he was working as a waiter, and the week before the two-year anniversary of him living in LA was coming up, and the week before he called his mother and said, listen, I'm going to call it quits. I think, you know, nothing is coming my way, I'm going to come home. And she said, give it one more week. And the next week, at the beginning of the week, he said he got a call back about his audition for the office, and he said he said he got Jim. He got the role of Jim. I mentioned that example on radio when I was talking about it on CRC because it's a good example of you know it's not all sunshine and rainbows in Hollywood I think everyone knows that by now but I think some people just have this perception of if you're working as an actor if you're working as a director if you're working as a writer you have it made you don't it takes so long in that cog in that machine to reach the top not every actor when they get into that system, is going to become Tom Cruise level, is going to have that peak of the mountain achieved. And it's very rare that it happens. And until that happens, until they know that they're secure in their career, they will keep second jobs. And just going back to John Krasinski, he mentioned that during season one of The Office, even though it looked like a sure thing at some times, at some stages, they were very happy with what they were achieving. The majority of the cast kept their second jobs, whether it was waitresses, whether it was busboys, whether they were, you know, working in, you know, a shop or anything like that. They kept their second jobs because they didn't know how long this would last. And they don't necessarily quit those jobs unless they positively know, okay, I can put all my eggs into this basket. So adapt that to the strike right now. Writers and actors, the majority of them are making their way through their career and they still don't have that security blanket. They still don't have that guarantee that things are going to work out well for them in this career, in this line of work. And at the very least, you know, they should be able to rely on the paycheck that they're receiving for their work. And even that isn't a guarantee. So that's why the writers are striking right now, fair wages. When it comes to the actors... Again, I think if there's lack of sympathy for writers, there's twice the lack of sympathy for actors. Again, the perception around Hollywood, like I said already, I think it goes for actors as well. Not every actor is living a life of luxury. Most actors are living you know, this life of, this life of modesty because they don't want everything they could have ripped away. And it's not until you reach that peak, that brow of the hill and that peak of success, your definition of success. There's some actors who just become b actors for the majority of their career and don't reach that pinnacle. Tom Cruise is one of the biggest stars in the world right now. He's proven it time and time again with his performances and he's reached that definition of success and that high maintenance of success. Look at Adam Sandler, even though I think he's undervalued in some areas, he is a high-paid actor, he makes millions upon millions a year, he has that security. Most actors don't. And in this case, the actors that are striking are actors who don't have that security blanket, who feel mistreated in Hollywood and don't have that, that financial security. And just looking at some of the actors who are striking for SAG and looking to raise the issues in this strike, Colin Farrell, you have Aubrey Plaza, Mandy Patinkin, Adam Scott, Nick Kroll, Jane Fonda, Sean Astin, so many more. Seth Rogen came out, I saw an interview with him saying that the issue is far from settled. And even the studios are not on the same page with the CEOs. Everyone is so far away from each other on this issue and so detached. But if you want the overview and you just 
you're not in tune with what's happening at the moment and you see it on TV and you want to know, okay, should I feel bad for these actors or writers? Should I be on the side of the CEOs? Should I have this perception of, oh, they're grand, they're only whining about more money, they're being greedy? I think the perception of these actors and writers being greedy is what the CEOs want us to believe. Because if we believe they're being greedy, they're not go- we're not going to take these issues seriously. And the writers and the, stri- uh, the strike of the writers and the strike of the actors will fail. And the CEOs can go on to treat them badly still and not pay them, pay them fair wages, make them overworked and undervalued still, demand extreme working hours of animate- animated writers and animation artists and everything like that. But if we really take a step back an objective step back we'll realize that it's a bunch of bullshit and that the ceos and the executives want us to think that these actors and writers are greedy because that means they can keep on getting away with it they can keep on getting away with not giving proper work conditions for actors on set for working them to the bone for not paying their actors fairly for not paying actors residuals for streaming services, which I'll get into in a minute, and for not paying writers fair enough wages to the point where they can actually live a life of security. So overall, if we're going to look at this objectively, we need to actually look at actors and look at writers and say, listen, they aren't being treated fairly. We need to actually be on the side of this. Okay, overall, how is this going to affect cinema? No one striking is going out and saying, boycott this movie, boycott this studio, don't go and watch this movie, don't go and watch this TV show. That might happen down the line, the further this goes. And as I already mentioned, Seth Rogen has said that everyone is so far away from solving this issue that it's going to be another while until this actually gets resolved. And looking at the historical part of this strike, this is the first time in 60 years that there's been an industry-wide shutdown. That should tell you how serious this should be taken. Another big reason why actors are striking and speaking out against studios in Hollywood, studio executives and CEOs of streaming platforms is residuals on streaming platforms. Let's talk about this for a minute. Listen, we're all likely to subscribe to Netflix, Hulu, Disney Plus and all these other different platforms by now. I know that I have subscriptions to multiple because we like variation, we like choice, and there's so much variety out there now. There's so many different streaming platforms competing for our business. The likes of Disney+, Plus, the likes of Hulu, the likes of Amazon Prime and Netflix. And a lot of TV shows find their second life and almost go through a cult classic phase on Netflix. One TV show that had that was Gilmore Girls. Now the reason I bring up Gilmore Girls is one of the actors, one of the big actors involved in this strike is protesting CEOs of Netflix because Gilmore Girls made tons of money for Netflix. It was one of their most popular shows week after week, month after month, year after year on that platform. And none of the actors see any residuals from that. If you're wondering what residuals are, it's kind of like royalties. So if you get royalties off music, how many times it's played, you know, it's the same thing for TV. Actors in the late 2000s, before streaming platforms, you know, in the early noughties and in the 90s, you know, the likes of Friends, the likes of Seinfeld, the mainstay actors on those TV shows could count on royalties and residuals from those TV shows and live off that. Again, talking about security blankets, that was a financial security blanket for many actors on these TV shows. The likes of actors on Seinfeld, the likes of actors on Friends, you know, Matt LeBlanc, Lisa Kudrow, you know, Courtney Cox, and Jennifer Aniston, the mainstay actors on these hit TV shows had these residuals to count on to make sure that they weren't in any way financially vulnerable. But unfortunately, that's not the case with streaming platforms. And looking at Gilmore Girls, you had Sean Gunn come out and start to protest the CEOs of Netflix. Sean Gunn had a great stint on Gilmore Girls and after that really struggled as an actor. In the past few years, his luck has changed and he has started to star in movies more regularly, most notably the Gardens of the Galaxy franchise. You may know him from that movie. I know I certainly do, but I would have known him from Gilmore Girls as well. And the one thing he says is it's criminal the way actors can't rely on those residuals anymore. You know, it's something that was always part and parcel of TV shows 
whether you were on a TV show on Nickelodeon or Comedy Central, actors could rely on those royalties, those residuals. And that's something that the actors are trying to hold streaming platforms accountable for. So looking at it from that angle, that's another reason why actors and writers are striking at the moment. And listen, you may hear this podcast and say, listen, I still don't care about it. But there is two big reasons why normal people like me and you should care about this strike. One, the biggest one in my opinion, there's not going to be big movies made. There's not going to be TV shows continued on season after season. If you're looking forward to a big movie coming out at the moment and you have your heart set on this TV show making a new season... You better be able to sit and wait for a good long time because there are several TV shows and movies deeply affected by this strike and have permanently called a hiatus on the production. Just to name a few, The Last of Us Season 2 has permanently shut down along with Abbott Elementary and Wednesday. Community, the movie which I was so looking forward to this year has shut down permanently and probably won't be out until 2024. Stranger Things Season 5 won't be out until at least 2026, it's projected. On top of that, you have Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning 2, and several others. So, if you're a fan of any of those movies, of any of those TV shows, then that's why you should care about this strike. That's why you should have a vested interest in making sure that you support these actors and writers who are striking at the moment. If you don't care about any of those movies or TV shows, then I would just think about your favourite actor or actress who is being overworked and underpaid during this strike and in Hollywood right now because there are plenty of talented actors and actresses striking right now for better work conditions. Like I've mentioned, this is an ongoing process. It's not going to end anytime soon. So if you do have an interest in this strike, I'm sure you can read up about it online. There's plenty of articles and interviews to be read and watched over YouTube and on different news sites as well. Let me know what you think of this strike. If you've heard about it, if this is the first time you're hearing about it, let me know your thoughts. I'd love to know your opinions up on Anchor FM and Spotify. I personally hope that the strike ends soon. It's terrible what's happening to these writers and actors, and it's really not fair. And on top of that, there's so much good TV and so many good movies that are being put on hold and really we're depriving ourselves and we're being deprived of great entertainment because of this strike so hopefully it ends soon next up i'll be joined by my first guest to review barbie I'm joined by my guests to review Barbie, both my sisters on the podcast, Emma and Leah. Emma has been on the podcast before to review Marvel movies. This is the first time I've had Leah on. I'm very excited to get to see the new studio. Welcome to the podcast, guys. Thanks. Uh, thank you. And you get to use the new mics as well. Well, Leah, Leah's yeah. mic is new anyway. It's no, um, it. the pod mic. Um, yeah, I got it for cheap, actually. Um, but yeah, really excited very to try them out. And it just looks... Like, even though these are good ones, it looks cool, doesn't it? Yeah, it does, actually. Profesh. Professional. Real professional. So, Barbie, guys. um, Leah, you've been able to go and see the movie again for a second time. I was super nervous. I was like, I need to watch it again. Give give that big critique. Um, I don't think me and Emma have seen it a second time yet. But to be honest, I don't think I need to see it a second time. I probably will down the line. I do. I think I'd actually... I was like, oh, I was going just for this. And then, obviously, I brought Chris, but I was going just for this because I was obviously nervous. But it actually watched really well the second time. It's kind of like it reminded me a bit like of you know the Heat with Sandra Bullock and Melissa McCarthy. You know, you can watch that over and over. I feel like you I watch, love you that movie. Watch, too. You could watch that. You could watch this over Groove and over. And you're picking heart. up loads of yeah, little, yeah, yeah, little cute oh yeah, that scene. <laughs> you're picking up loads of cool dialogue and cute little things that we didn't see the first time around because I thought it was quite emotional the first time around. Especially that that section with the montage. I think that's because our mom was with us. Yeah, she's always trying to make us emotional. Yeah. Always make me cry. Let's just talk about that for a minute because, <laughs> by the way, if you're hearing scurrying in this part of the segment or in this part of the episode, we do have Roxy, our family dog, in the room with us. Um, But looking at the first time we saw it, Leanne cried in the last 10 minutes. Mom cried in the first 10 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. 
But like I like I talked about this movie on CRC um for my movie segment and to be honest, I did like it. You know, there's a lot of things this movie gets right from a blockbuster movie standard. Oh, yeah. Obviously, first of all, the soundtrack, soundtrack went yeah. went mm-hmm. down very well, yeah, especially yeah. Billie Eilish's song. Yeah, it's well, a good one. What was I yeah. made for? Yeah, well, what was I made for? And, you know, I saw an inter- interview with her mm. and she had actually said that this is the first song she's been proud of for a while. And she really? said she's kind of been, I suppose, lax and... Stuck in a rope. Yeah, and lacking motivation in terms of inspiration for writing, and this just kind of popped in, popped into her head. And even I don't know if you've seen the music video. The music video is very good as well. No, I yeah. um, she's kind of making miniature clothes and like oh, sewing okay. miniature clothes at this table, and she's dressed up like you know nineteen fifties Barbie. Yeah, I see the bit um, on Spotify. You know, when they pull up the lyrics, I can see a little bit. Yeah, yeah, it's a thread throughout. Like even I was, I noticed like you know when she goes to, I'm presuming. Do you do like a summary or whatever? Like, is it I'm not spoiling anything by talking anything? About well, if you haven't seen it yet, yeah, that's your fault. Oh, yeah. Spoilers incoming. Yeah, well, obviously this. <laughs> also, is how have you not seen it if you're on TikTok? Because it's mm. like all over TikTok. I feel like everybody's seen it, even if they didn't go see it. Yeah. No, yeah. Um, but talking about her and the soundtrack and that song, like even when Barbie goes and she's running away from the Mattel guys, and she goes to Raya Perlman, who's yeah, Ruth. Yeah, root, yeah. Um the music on uh Ruth's radio in her kitchen um is the Billy Irish song. Yeah. Yeah. And but it like wor- it old works old school kind of fifties style music, which I thought was really cool. It works very well. Yeah. By the way, just talking about the cast for a minute, mm. I think it was perfect casting for this movie. Absolutely agree, yeah. Um I saw an interview with Greta Gerwig saying that America Ferreira was the first one to receive the script. Oh. Before casting had even begun. Oh. Wow. Um they tend I think they have a good relationship on and off screen, obviously. And Greta Garwig, by the way, very talented director yeah. and you know, I haven't seen her as an actress in many movies, but you know, she um No, what's she done? Lady Bird. Lady Bird Little Women. Little Women and Barbie. Mm. Um there's probably another one that I'm forgetting, but um, you know, yeah, I she's thought, great. Yeah, I thought it was very good. But yeah, she said that America Ferrer was the first person she thought of to send the script to. Really? Um, I don't know if that was because she had, you know, an idea of, okay, this character would be played by America, but mm. um, it was uh, the first person she thought of I to send her. it to. Yeah. I didn't watch Ugly Betty, but I love her in Superstore. I just love her. Yeah, I, I was never big into Ugly Betty either. But, but she's su- great. She's great as well. She's yeah. perfect. Like, she's yeah. a perfect every woman. You know what I mean? Very true. Like, I think she's beautiful and I think that she's the perfect mom in this, but she's also the perfect woman. Do you know that kind of way? Like she's mm. not, she, you know, I, I just think she's great. Emma, uh, there was a lot of younger women at that and like younger men as well. I was pleased to see that it wasn't just a bunch of girls and I wasn't the only man in there because I went with E2, Mom and Leanne. I think this movie has been received a bunch of different ways from women uh, in their 20s and in their early teens. How did you receive it? Well, first of all, I actually didn't know what them... I saw so much on my TikTok, but yet when I was lining up, I was like, I still actually don't know what the context of the movie is. I think it was I was saying to you, Lee, I was like, I actually didn't know when I came out. I was like, I didn't know what it was going to be. I thought it was... I didn't think it was going to touch on such big topics. Yeah. I thought it was just going to be a fun Barbie movie. Yeah, I remember you saying that. I, I hadn't yeah. watched anything. I tr- I hadn't actively avoided it, but you know, your For You page, like once you so like something, it'll start. I hadn't Actually, seen anything. I had just seen a little bit of a trailer and that's really it. Yeah. And you are right. It does touch on massive topics. The production design is amazing. Mm-hmm. And like you, Emma. It's all no CGI. No. All um, painted. You've seen the videos of them yeah. doing the painting the massive backdrops like that's yeah. amazing like the scene where they're traveling to the real world and they have to go by boat yeah. and horse or like um yeah. in the car the as camper well van, yeah um, it's more realistic though yeah but it's pra- it's it's a uh, practical sets um and, and produ- the dream houses are all yeah all the stuff i, th- I thought that was great which was very good Each i was massive into barbies when i was younger i know you were either a brats girl or a barbie girl Depending on what age you were, whereas like brats for me weren't yeah. out 
they were dead when I was me. young. Yeah, they were. I wanted to, but I just love Barbie. Did I you see dream houses? Speaking yeah. of brats, did you see that? Yeah. The four girls at yes, the yeah, yeah, at yeah. the table Trisasha are supposed. Sasha is named after. Yeah. They all are named. They're all after. named after all brats. Named after brats. brats. Yeah. And yeah. it's very, it's very cool. That's a cool Easter egg, considering it the fact is, that yeah. they're all basically shitting on Barbie. Yeah. And saying, "Oh, you." It makes sense because, yeah. like that, that's like the not well, kind of like the rival brats to Barbies, as you were saying. And they're yeah. Brats than her yeah. As well. Exactly. They came that kind of generation yeah. later. I, I want to get your thoughts on the casting because obviously there's a big mm-hmm. a lot of big names on in this. Margot Robbie kind of nailed the depiction of Barbie. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ryan Gosling was a lot. I thought he was a lot funnier than I was than he had any right to be. I thought he was perfect. You know, like perfect. Yeah, yeah. perfect. So so sure of his masculinity. To, yeah, like you have to be so yeah. so sure in yourself. Yeah. as a man, so secure to be yeah. able to take first of all directions from. A female director, mm-hmm. and also play the part of Ken, where he is a secondary person, yeah, mm. and admit that he is nothing without Barbie. Yeah, yeah. he just and played a soap. He was so like comical. Also, yeah, I love that. He was so pr- was Margot Robbie. Yeah, they were very comical. Like, and with him, he was like not threatening, not intimidating. He was, you know, to look at. Obviously, like body got a great body but like his face he's not like that like stereotypical like hollywood mm. movie kind of face he has kind of a you know unusual handsome face and yeah. he was really goofy i like the goof the goofiness which i yeah. thought was a lot of fun I, th- I don't think anyone else could have played it you heard how he got in contact with greta or greta got in contact with him and how he his kids were playing with barbies and <laughs> they have a ken and the Ken that they were playing with, um, he took a picture of Ken uh, that his kids were playing with, and uh, their Ken doll was face down in the dirt with a squished lemon beside this Ken doll. And he took a picture of Ken and he said to Greta, I need to tell this man's story. <laughs> <laughs> Which is always funny. And she said as well that he's the only person she felt, uh, that's what you're saying, like she's the only person he she felt could play Ken. And that could actually respond without ego to a female director, which I think says a lot about actors and how obviously misogynism still exists. You know what I mean? That she would, that she as a female director, a solo female director, would be worried about yeah, a lar- like a a famous, successful Hollywood male actor taking directions from her. And not be, and and not being um, egotistical about being a secondary character and bull- yeah. and then bulldozing the movie and making it uh, very hard mm. for them to get on with it. But I just think that that's that's it's hopefully in like ten, twenty, thirty years, solo female directors will become more common and they won't have to think twice about who they hire as their leading man or leading woman or leading they them are. Or secondary characters, they will just feel that people should respect them because they're in the role of director if they're a good kind of person. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. That it shouldn't be an issue. I thought that Will Ferrell as the main antagonist. <laughs> he was great. Perfect cast. Perfect villain. Perfect. Because villain. again, this movie, I think it's like it's, it's supposed to be a fun filled movie. Like, mm-hmm, and, a, and along, I kind of ta- saw this as Mattel bringing Barbie into the 21st century in in some ways as well mm-hmm. and kind of acknowledging like again there's the whole context of how certain right wing political minded people especially politically minded men have responded to this movie and we'll talk about that in a minute but um the fact that this movie like you said Emma and you touched on Lee as well it really touches on deep-seated issues in society and you're not expecting it i found it a bit jarring to be honest and it's not because i was thinking oh i'm i have to sit down and take um take my talking to or i'm being lectured to here it was because you see this bright vibrant film you see you're trying to wrap your head around the concept of okay they're bringing barbie to life and uh, these not action figures but these um these toys to life and you're not expecting a social commentary on feminism, on 
the patriarchy, on the gender divide mm-hmm. and the gap in society. I was amazed at how many English actors and actresses were in this movie. Mm. Sharon Rooney from uh, My Mad Fat Diary. Yeah. Um, you also she had e- Emma Mackey from yeah. Sex Education. Yeah. Um, it was like loads of sex education yeah. just, so just Greta Gerwig I actually looked up to see did Greta Gerwig like direct an episode of sex education yeah. at one point because I thought she must love that show she loved it didn't she I'm going to mispronounce his name but I'm going to try anyway Nkutu Gatwa who he's playing the new um, Doctor Who yeah amazing uh, he was in it like, yeah, and he was Connor very good uh, yeah and he was yeah, yeah he um, Connor Swindles was um, on the board but he, uh, he was yeah, on the board he was, but one, of the workers he, he was one of the workers that it came to the board yeah, with the problem yeah, yeah. and one of the board members is in Fleabag as well English actor oh I know who you're talking about yeah the, like the right hand the executive yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly and mm. there was actually a guy I noticed today um I don't know if people watch Skins but the later seasons of Skins one of the three you know who you're talking about Connor Swindles when he's in the lower boardroom area or the lower work area there's a guy with red hair that like pops up yeah. over the cubicle he's in the I later s- season of Skins I he's spotted him too well. again I don't know and the actor's um, name but what's your man from Taskmaster that we were talking about I gotta look, google him I gotta look that up now look because up. but yeah he was he's the warehouse worker yeah and it was I think a um, few minutes on screen and in terms of Irish act- actresses you know you had uh Nicola Co- Coughlin. Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I was hoping she would have a bit more to do in the movie, but again, to have a scene in that kind of movie and to book that Asim, role. Asim Chowdhury. Asim Chowdhury, nice. That's who it is. That would have annoyed me all night. I know, right? It was good representation for English actors. Mm-hmm. You know, you had the actor who played Bren in Gavin Stacey. He was... Oh, uh, Rob Brydon. Yeah. Yeah, he was... Um, Sugar Daddy Ken. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Sugar's daddy, Ken. Oh, yeah, because that's what it was. It was okay. So it was like the dog or the cat. It was the dog oh, was yeah. called Sugar. Sugar so it was like Sugar's daddy, Ken. But like obviously they knew what they were doing. Speaking of dogs, you know how they have the dog. Like obviously Barbie had a dog, and I yeah, had that you dog. Had that exact dog. That yeah. poops. Yeah, I want to go that over so, so some of the Maybe accessories. <laughs> Some of the accessories in the movie because mm. Leanne kept on leaning over to me and be like, "Do you remember that?" And I was like, "No, I didn't play with Barbie growing up." Okay. Was, I had, I had not secure enough in your masculinity, Kyle. No, it's just like there was none going. You did um, play with someone that was in the Barbie movie. Yeah, I played. Da, with. Da, da, da. Oh, John, John Cena. Cena! Oh my God, John Cena! Oh yeah, by the way, that was like a last minute casting. He met. He always pops up somewhere. He, he met. Really does. He met Greta Gerwig in a restaurant in London. And she, she was, was like, like, do you want to be in the bar movie? He was like, yeah, sound. And also, like, Dua Lipa. Like, I know she's... She sang. She song. sang a song, yeah. but she was the female mermaid. Yeah, yeah, that's um, true. And beautiful. she was the multiple. So she's beautiful. Yeah. She's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Also, this, this, this was a, a debate or, like, something that Leanne was trying to figure out mm-hmm. after the movie. The Barbie that Margot Robbie plays is obviously the original Barbie. Yeah. Stereotypical, yeah, stereotypical Barbie, Barbie but Barbie, original. Yeah. And for the longest time after the watching the movie... And she even got on the phone to Megan about it. She was adamant that Beach Ken is not original Ken because she thought the original Ken didn't have blonde hair. Oh, yeah. No, he did, though, right? He did. Yeah, I've never they imagined. They were originally in bathing suits. Yeah, I never. They started. Yeah. I never I imagined. I think I had a blonde Ken. No? No, I don't think like I did. Like blonde, blonde, no. I didn't. Maybe like, like no, a. I always had a brunette Ken. Yeah. Or was that an Alan? No, because Alan was discontinued. Alan Can we talk about Alan? Yeah, well, yeah, we're going to get on Why to Alan now. Why does Michael look so weird? He's always looked weird. No, but weirder ginger than hair. normal. It's, it's just... the ginger, yeah. Maybe it's the ginger against the... Pale. He has stubble and then yeah. his face. Like, I love Michael Sarah. Michael Sarah is Arrested Development, right? Yep. George Michael. So good. But he's just, I think, he went out with Arby Plaza for years. Did he? Yeah. And she was like in love with him. Similar. Like she wanted right to get married to him. But he apparently he's like just as weird as her in real life. I and that's it, yeah. that's why they got on. But yeah, I was talking about, you know, the how Alan is supposed to be perceived in this movie. Mm-hmm. And it's very obvious that it's supposed to be you know, I've seen interviews saying like, Okay, he doesn't fit in with the Kens, he doesn't fit in with the Barbies. Yeah. And he's kinda like on the outside of society. Mm-hmm. But also I see him as, you know, pretty obvious that he represents the percentage of men who stand with women 
in like the fight against gender because when again like we said this is going to be a spoiler filled mm-hmm. review like because like Emma said if you haven't seen it by now um, what have you been doing? yeah you obviously don't want to see it so then stop listening to yeah, the so, podcast so stop listening like right when we start talking yeah but yeah I think you know looking at how the plot plays out mm. he decides to he doesn't feel accepted by the Kens yeah and he doesn't feel comfortable with the whole way the the kind of plot that the Kens have mm-hmm. and he doesn't he doesn't fit into that mold yeah um and he's very happy when the Barbies take back over and take yeah. back um their rightful place mm. could be like a non-binary thing as well a nod towards Probably. that you know what I mean because if you think about it the actual whole movie was quite like non-binary apart from obviously we have a trans Barbie you know what I mean mm-hmm. and obviously we were talking a little, a little bit about this today like about like box checking and diversity and that sort of thing and like obviously the movie is trying its best to be as inclusive as possible but how inclusive can a movie that's written by two white people and that are obviously very rich how inclusive can that be when also it's a Mattel production and all it's really about is about capitalism i mean you that's coming back to what you were saying about how you want to bring barbie into the 21st century christmas is coming up you know what i mean think about like how mega barbie is going to be Mm. at christmas time now yeah because of this movie so what i'm saying is like back to alan like i agree with you that he could be a representative of you know a man that wants to stand with women you know, outside of the patriarchy here to fight against it, but it also could be a nod to like a they them situation, you know, because it wasn't like the movie is like ticking boxes. Like, obviously, you had like a fat Barbie, you have like, you know, you've got your POCs, you know, you've got your trans, but like, and then you've got Alan, but it's not going to be able to do everything all the time, you know what I mean? Even I was talking about like, obviously, the representation of like a fat or a plus size woman. Um, it's what's her name? Sharon Rooney, yeah, Sharon Rooney. Um, like she still subscribed and have to subscribe to be palatable to the audience to the ideal of she was still beautiful her hair was done her makeup was done she had long hair her waist was snatched like she was wearing really beautiful clothes you know what I mean she was covered in a way that was acceptable to the audience but and while it's nice to see representation it's also important to note how that is being put forward it's still being put forward so that the so that it's palatable to the audience you know what i mean yeah i think you know looking at so i keep on going back to the fact that this movie really didn't pull any punches mm. and and to be honest it's hard to get through all the issues in this movie because i think what it's like two hours three hours long yeah you're not gonna i mean no, no you're not it's gonna be perfect and no like that, coming back to what you were saying about like politically minded men i mean i don't necessarily think that they're politically minded i think they might be a little bit um they just feel threatened yeah by the like, way like I, I said this on radio and i'll say it again mm-hmm. if you're a grown man and you went to see barbie and mm-hmm. you feel threatened by it in any way grow the fuck up yeah i have um, two i have two points on that one if you go to the barbie movie and you're going to like hate watch it cop on because <laughs> you could be doing so much more with your life like why yeah. you, it's like hate following someone on instagram why are you watching somebody's stories yeah. and like trolling them like is it ben shapiro went and like started bur- was he buying barbies to burn barbies like ben a, shapiro a did life. yeah ben shapiro did a 42 minute review and he he got ridiculed on why actually you know what Let's online leave, i don't even want to talk about him because that if that's that's even giving too much oxygen to fair enough <laughs> so Point number one, don't go to see it if you're going to hate watch it because get it. Can I curse on here? Yeah, of course get you can. Fucking life. <laughs> can I curse on here? It says as quiet as possible. Well. Can I curse on here? Get please? a fucking life. No, second thing is if you're sitting there in the audience and as a cis het man, you're uncomfortable with what you're seeing, you have to question are you part of some of the problematic behavior you're seeing in the Kens? Because if you feel uncomfortable about it, there's a likelihood that either you or the people you hang around with are part of some of the problematic behavior seen. And I don't mean like the sexist construction workers that are saying ter- terribly lewd things to Barbie and Ken, even just semi, you know, problematic things, right? Um, That's my second point. My last point uh, about the whole political aspect, I mean, it's probably not going to be my last point in this trio, right? Is if you go to it and you think, oh this is an anti-men movement you don't understand feminism and you don't understand patriarchy because if you sat there and you actually watched it and you actually listened to the dialogue and you actually looked at the plot you would understand that it's 
highlighting how damaging the patriarchy is for both men and women. The amount of time given to Ken and how it's affected him and his identity throughout the whole movie, and especially that section at the end with the song and after the song, like it gives so much time. And we'll that talk about song. the song because the song is amazing. Um, I'm but Ken, it gives I'm, so much time yeah. to his identity. So that's my last thing. You don't understand patriarchy and you don't understand feminism if you've got a problem with this movie and if you say it's anti men because patriarchy affects us all, it damages us all, it actually damages men just as much as females and second of all feminism is just another word for egalitarianism which means eco- equality and equity so that's thank you for coming to my ted talk okay <laughs> that, that's your talking to i don't even need to host this podcast anymore. i was gonna say as well that i love how um pen number two i'm gonna butcher his name now no what's Sim- um simi let's talk let's talk him up and yeah. it shang was he shang marvel? from the marvel he's yeah. like a, he's like a, a marvel superhero i'm not big see i'm not a marvel Oh, he I was know, I know the, the movie. Was I just 20, didn't. Twenty one, Shang Shang Shi. He was like. I definitely know the movie. Arts, I just didn't. Kind of superhero. Okay, Amazing. I have it here. Watching yeah, Simuli. Simuli. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he's yeah. Okay. Oh, I see him. Okay. Okay. Yeah, he was I'm like a um, Marvel, Marvel person. Ryan Gosling's. Yeah, Marvel yeah, like beginning. rival. Yeah, I love how they use like, like he he is you know, so many people love Marvel movies and you know mm-hmm. little young boys and everything look up. At Marvel movies and superheroes, so it's then really to get point, someone yeah. that is a superhero mm-hmm. to play a Ken, you know, you can do it all. Yeah, I like that. And I also really like that they had an Asian male as like a Ken, which is like traditionally like an object of desire. Because if you think about it, a lot of the time when we look at movies, when we look at especially new films, we don't often see like Asian men. Even if you look like casting for like Love Island and that, Asian men don't get cast an awful lot. And I just, I just thought it was nice to see that, you know yeah, what I mean? That they, like the black Ken, they had like kind of dad Ken, you know? You're yeah, not, I don't, yeah, I don't he's remember. Chris Evans' brother. Is that Chris Evans? Yes, no, it is. no, yeah. Chris Wait, are you Evans? Talk- yeah, or Chris, Chris Evans. Evans. It is, is the it? blondie guy who was like the president. He's kind of old. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I'll think. show you. Um, I didn't know that was his brother. Yeah, because I was saying that today to Chris. Let me see. Uh, yeah, Scott Chris. Evans. There you go. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I thought it was a Hemsworth, but it was Evans. Oh yeah, there's the three Hemsworths. Maybe that's what I was thinking. Yeah. To the older brother, the Hemsworth. Yeah. To get a bit um, critical, mm-hmm. something you didn't like about the movie, something you thought could have uh, been done a bit better, or was kind of skimmed two over. Things. I have one thing. And I'll go first because yeah. mine is just a silly thing. I don't actually have anything. Um, I was just so confused where the whole dance thing of the Ken song came out of. I was like, what's mm. going on? That's I kind of loved it. I loved it in the end, but it just came out of nowhere and it went on for so long. I was yeah. just like, where the hell is this come out at? That's all. But I, it's not that I hated that. I, was, that I was have just a theory about at that. At the time, I was like, what the hell? I have a theory about that. Will making up minutes? No, we're not making up minutes, but... I think that it's like a metaphor for how men are not allowed to express their emotions and also don't feel comfortable about expressing their emotions um, and how like art and music is used quite a lot to allow men to express emotions. Like think about Louis Capaldi, think about Harry Styles, think about um, maybe you're too maybe young to think about this, but Eric Clapton, his son died. and he I've been wrote, listening to one. Tears, what's it called? Tears of Heaven or whatever. I don't know. I don't know if about that but i've listened to one eric clapton song on repeat yeah so yeah. men use and have tradition use music and song as a way to process emotions and we all do right i mean you cry at a song you cry at kesha praying it's because it touches something right so i think that's what it's about it's like he goes from not being able to talk about his emotions like he pretends to barbie that he doesn't care about things and then he goes you know, to fighting his adversary, his rival, Simili. That's funny. Yeah, so good, right, at the beach. And then he goes, then they're all in black, they're singing and dancing, you see men embracing. So it's about, like, the the journey, the emotional journey of men. And then at the end of that song, he's able then to actually voice his emotions to Barbie. So I I think that's it's meant to be a metaphor. I also think it's meant to be fun because sometimes things are just fun. And also I liked how uh, at the end they kind of shoehorned a bunch of different lessons in at the end. The one that I thought was very useful was, I suppose, you know, at the end, Ken can't get over the fact that, like, the his love for Barbie isn't reciprocated, and mm-hmm. he's defined his identity 
the main point of his identity is his relationship with Barbie. Mm-hmm. And I think there there's a danger in that, like a real life danger of like, I suppose, having your whole identity be this relationship and not yeah. And kind of forgetting you're an individual outside of it. Mm-hmm. And so I think that was a good kind of... Um, that happens to women more regularly. I think it happens probably to men as well, yeah. but it's just not as highlighted because they feel yeah. like it's it's weak or whatever. I think as well, separate a little bit from Barbie and say that it was that it's like about men needing to be seen as an object of desire for to feel worthy. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Um, and I don't think when you say shoehorn, do you mean that? Because for me, shoehorn is like a negative thing. I when, the reason I use shoehorn is mm. because I just felt like it was rushed. Do you think so? I yeah. think they give. I think they That's, give a- adequate time to that. No, I felt it was just. It, no, it, I think I think we saw the transition with the emotions. Then he came into the bedroom. He's crying on the bed. He does the weird thing where like. She's like, are you okay? And he's like, <laughs> yeah, totally fine. Like, <laughs> tries to kiss her. <laughs> and then he like, he like goes to throw himself off the balcony when she doesn't want to be with him. And then she's like, and then he's like, no, no, I'll kiss you. Uh, I thought, I thought they gave a lot of. Maybe it was rushed in that we saw, it felt maybe rushed for you because emotionally we see him go from, go through a lot of emotions. But in terms of actual minutes given in a movie, I think that they gave us quite a lot of time with him to be honest with you. And that's why I think like, if men are not seeing that. They're not comfortable enough to see it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. My pet peeve or my mm. um, dislike and, you know, like I couldn't get a best, like the logic of the movie, movie, the logic jump. And I was like, but, hey, but again, but again, hey, I just want to let you know, Barbie's not real. Seriously. <laughs> yeah. Fuck. It's fiction. I why, based, why are you so triggered? I based my whole review around yeah. that, that Barbie's real. Fuck, really? Shit. Shit, there. Um, Should we start again? Mind blown. We'll just, just know, right? hit reset. No, it's... it's. Santa's not real either. No. Oh, Tooth Fairy is also fake. Mom was giving you money all those years. Leah, you were like shattering Barbie. a lot of kids' minds here on this. <laughs> just like ruining childhoods. Sorry. Left, right and centre. <laughs> no, I suppose it's not, not the logic of it, but I just felt... Mm. I felt fucking disoriented at the times because i'm like that's because we were sitting so near the fucking screen lads i couldn't see the screen my neck was sore my this was me this was me the whole movie i was looking back and forth because the screen was so big they can't yeah. see the start, i couldn't actually i know that's why i said this is, I this is all toy. back and forth they can imagine my face moving back and forth uh, and i couldn't see did you feel that I felt um, so close. Sorry, I felt back to what you're saying you're disoriented no close yeah close but it's it? just because we were going from the real world to this and like i'm like okay but you got to question that. you got to question your internal bias about that a little bit. No. Yeah. Because the thing is, right, you got to question why. Like, do you, do you question Marvel movies? Yeah. No. Not as much as I've seen the questioning of this movie. Like, when I see people on TikTok questioning the dialogue, and I'm like, guys, it's a fucking movie about Barbies. Like, it. yes, it's a social commentary. Oh, right? no, like, I, I'm not, like, questioning it, like, oh, where's the... Li-? It's literally just like, okay... I don't know how, like, because like it took me a while to actually wrap my head around like how I actually felt about the movie. Because, mm. but like I said, I just think I was just because, like, what I said earlier on, I wasn't expecting it. I wasn't expecting yeah. everything to be thrown at me, and then yeah. like I was. It's quite complex. I suppose like it was kind of like information overload, mm-hmm. and I was kind of like, okay, I wasn't prepared for this. I'm trying mm-hmm. to process it, that's interesting. and that's why you know I said you know like the couple of days after we saw the movie mm-hmm. i reviewed it on crc mm-hmm. fm i'd never been as nervous for a review yeah, in fair. my life which you're is cis-het man you're white the devil you can see that through the radio <laughs> well i'm just saying yeah. i can hear it in your he voice he sounds white <laughs> well <laughs> um but i think it was because you know i didn't want to be i wanted to stay objective in terms of okay mm-hmm. is this a good movie yeah and because that's bottom line that's my job on that on that mm-hmm, segment mm-hmm. it's not about oh this is a great movie for like for this reason it's, it's like mm-hmm. okay objectively and this is my true opinion like mm-hmm. product design amazing amazing yeah. and the fact that there was no cgi done in that movie so good um casting was next to none i thought mm-hmm. it was perfect agreed and it gave a lot of on-screen talent who maybe mm-hmm. don't get chance like emma said you know like um simuli a leading man in yeah. hollywood who's uh asian and like i, I don't think mm-hmm. like asians get a fair deal in terms of Agreed. booking those kind of roles so it did well for diversity and yeah. listen yeah, at, the, at, the, at the end of the day like i, I wasn't going away thinking like oh well 
this is all about hating men and like yeah oh, no I'm not saying like that well, why like why 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 are they making us think like this and like oh this mm-hmm. is this is bad for society and it's going to mm-hmm. teach young boys wrong things like it's fucking Period. Barbies yeah and I don't think that deep about movies no you should though I mm-hmm. think people who if you're a grown up mm-hmm. regardless of gender and you think that the Barbie movie is going to change the way you live your life or affect you in any negative way of living your life you're wrong mm-hmm. it's i saw it as bottom line a love letter to women yeah. i i think it is like because that's really what it is like because mm-hmm. that whole speech from america ferrera sums up the movie you know i don't know verbatim but she's basically going through the contradictory mm-hmm. nature, nature of nature, femininity and mm-hmm. what society expects you to mm-hmm. be as a woman you can you need to be forthright, but you can't be too harsh. Um, you need to uh, be feminine, but mm-hmm. you also need to look professional. Like, and I think that you know that is the core of the movie, and her character is is the core of the movie as well. Because, like we saw in that film, the reason Barbie comes to the real world is because of her, yeah. is because because of America Ferrera and what mm-hmm. she's going through internally with her daughter, and overall as a movie as a standpoint in terms of what it has to say yeah o- overall it's a positive message and oh, for sure i think i'm secure enough with my masculinity to walk away and be like oh yeah that's a movie it does well in terms of giving men a platform like you said leah mm-hmm. of like men like often don't think okay i can't be emotional about this mm-hmm. i have mm-hmm. a hard time uh, men don't feel they can have their emotions and yeah you know like that's what the song is about and exactly yeah i think you know see if you've seen the memes the bit uh, what men take away from this movie is i am ken enough yeah <laughs> and, and i actually want that hoodie that it looks, hoodie he wears yeah it's it looks so really good cool. i really want it by the way i meant to i meant to talk a bit more about this but um i just want to pick you up on something about the whole yeah. love letter thing yeah, like a love letter to women i think like a love letter is like love like it should be love should be kind and safe and warm and i think like with this while i think it might be like a celebration or like you know obviously it's centered around women and women's experience i think it's more like from my perspective anyway it's more like you know a celebration of like girlhood and Mm. a celebration of like what a lot of people would have trivialized previously like how like you know think about the whole like the trope of the basic bitch right the like pumpkin spice latte and oh your starter packs for being a basic bitch kind of thing like barbies might be part of that because it's like a stereotype stereotype for a girl or whatever so like with this it kind of said okay we can't be we shouldn't trivialize um you know girlhood anymore and it's more of a celebration of that rather than a love letter to women i think what it what it is really is a call to action and, and a kind of a dedication to yeah we should try and change things and it's more like highlighting patriarchy from my point of view anyway you know yeah we will continue this conversation in a few minutes unfortunately emma has to leave us but thanks for coming on to the podcast emma where are you going thanks because i got a business to run that's why i'm you can say it out loud you don't have to whisper (laughs) oh sorry (laughs) Bye. bye We are back talking Barbie. Thanks again to Emma for coming on the podcast. She had to leave a bit early. She has a delivery uh, for her business box of bakes. By the way, if you want cakes or cupcakes or wedding cakes or any occasion, um, she does great work. So yeah, check not, her out on Instagram. At yeah, box of bakes. That's not me just plugging my uh, sister because uh, she it is, actually is. Two things can be true. It's her. Yes, it's indeed. Us plugging her and also. Making sure that you have delicious treats in your life. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> um, <laughs> and this sounds just like a sponsored thing, but it's not. Um, <laughs> I wish it was. Then you can make some money off this shit. Yeah. When are we start going to start making some money? Um, <laughs> making that moolah. Making that moolah. Yeah, it's moolah. box of bakes. So it's box underscore of underscore bakes underscore. And she does great on work. Instagram. Um, Unbelievable stuff. So we're going back to pet peeves. Mm-hmm. You actually didn't mention yours. So, pet peeves. 
two things that stuck out to me. So before I watched the movie, I followed this creator on Instagram called Dr. Blackwell. And she's a female POC doctor, obviously. And um, she talked a bit. She highlighted the smallpox joke that America Ferrer makes. And it's obviously like a metaphor for why the Barbies have succumbed so quickly to Ken coming back and, you know, teaching them all about patriarchy, right? So they liken it to in the 1500s when, um, you know, explorers came over and mass genocide was created um, and smallpox was obviously spread and all of that, right? That they had no defenses against it. And, like, the thing is, when I read about the joke before I went to the movie, I was kind of waiting for it. I thought they were going to hook it up at the joke. And I also thought it was quite interesting that, like, a Latina made the joke and not made it obviously she didn't write it but like she's the one that actually says it and the way in which America Ferrer's character says it is like she's explaining to us this is why these people succumbed so quickly to patriarchal structure in Barbie land right um but I just think I just thought it was unnecessary we don't need to do that and I think it was actually quite detrimental to like the Native American community and like it smacks of not having people from that minority group at the table you know what i mean like think about look at who who's represented in the barbies do you see a native american barbie and like yes you can say that'd be just box checking that'd be just ticking a box and you're right it would be but at the same time it smacks of them not being at the table right so like somebody nobody on the writers like nobody in the writers room nobody in production are from you know the reservations or are from that minority group that could pick that up and say mm, you know maybe that's not right maybe we shouldn't make that there's loads of other ways they could have explained to us how people in barbie lamb succumb so quickly to the patriarchy right without making that joke because it was genocide right we teach like i'm a history teacher so we teach about christopher columbus i don't teach about him anymore but like <laughs> you know uh, and in america they have like columbus day where they celebrate him but the, the fact is he created genocide you know what i mean like um so now i don't know anyway i just thought it was poor taste and i also just thought it didn't need to be there i think there's a lot of other ways they could have explained to us why the patriarchal structure became so uh quickly to the top in barbie land right that was the first thing i don't know what you think about that um that would uh, that would have gone completely over my head i don't mm. i don't even remember a smallpox joke yeah, so this, this is what I'm saying. Like, I just, it, it, and it is, it is something that can go completely over our heads because, like, let's be honest, like, we have a lot of privilege, like, whether you want to admit it or not. Like, as a, as a white person, like, I will have a privilege and I have to be aware of that. And we should all should be aware of that over all of our privileges. Like, for example, you're a man, you're going to have more privilege than me in society. So, <coughs> sorry. So, these are little things we want to be aware of and it just as again i said smacks of nobody picked that up mm. through the whole writer's room through the whole production through the editing of the script all of that and you can say as much as you like about greta gerwig and she obviously is an, a director to be admired she's the first solo female director to break a billion at the box office right yeah so like that amazing stuff but it's like these little things they're chinks in the armor and nothing's going to be perfect i absolutely agree no movie is perfect okay but it's these little things we don't need it we don't need it like the second thing that really irked me was Will Farrell made a joke, you know, he was making a joke and said, um, I don't like your attitude, I don't like to hear that resentment from Barbie who was saying, where are the women, don't women work here in the Mattel, let's talk about Mattel and the CEO in a minute, but, and he said, uh, I'm, I'm the mother of a, I'm the son of a mother, uh, he said, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the nephew of a female aunt, and it's like, like that was making me laugh, and then he went to, I have numerous Jewish friends and I just thought there's no need. Yeah. Like I feel like anti-Semitism is the new go-to joke because they feel like it's safe because a lot of, not a lot, but the stereotype is that Jewish people are mainly white and jokes about white people are safe. But the reality is like, there's lots of people that are Jewish, first of all. And second of all, anti-Semitism has existed well before the Reformation. Jewish people have been scapegoats for numerous years. And I just felt like it wasn't needed. You know what I mean? It's just feel, I feel like Hollywood needs to, you used shoehorn before, right? Why does Hollywood need to shoehorn in these little digs? You don't need it. Like, it was funny enough if you had just finished on, uh, I'm the nephew of a female aunt. Yeah. Like, that was funny. Leave it, you know? I didn't think too much about that, but mm. also, like, it does stand out that, like, that Jewish joke, I'm like, okay, that doesn't feel like it, right? it, it doesn't feel like it fits here. 
Um, yeah. And I just felt like maybe they were trying to go over this. In that triad, yeah. like it didn't yeah. fit, right? Before we end, because we uh, we have done a lot of talking about this movie <laughs> so far, um, I was not expecting you to be as prepared as you were. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, don't apologize. It's great. Because I got a lot of thoughts, you know, this about yeah. me. Um, but that's that's why I wanted to have you and Emma on because um, I didn't want to be reviewing this by myself as mm-hmm. a man. I wanted to get a female perspective sure, on yeah. it. And I think that's important you know, to open mm-hmm. up the dialogue. Two questions before we end. You mentioned Greta Gerwig and you know mm. the history she's made as first female director to break For a billion. Solo, yeah. Solo. Female, female director, director yeah. to break a billion at the box office. By the way, if you want to measure this movie's success and say, is it a good movie? There you it's, go. You're dictated by the market and how it does. Absolutely. You may not agree with the movie. You may not like the movie. But like Leah mentioned, just because something is, exists that you don't like doesn't mean you need to take time out of your day to hate on it. Yeah. And I think that exists across the board like it's going off topic here now but the women's world cup has been on our screens for mm-hmm. the past while and a lot of footballers in the industry you know like leah williamson and kate mccabe mm-hmm. you know especially some of the lionesses who have come out and said listen just because it's not for you doesn't mean it doesn't need to exist and, mm-hmm. and it can't exist yeah and she made a good analogy saying i'm not the biggest fan of cricket i don't go on twitter to slate it and say it shouldn't Such be. A good point, it shouldn't right? be a. It shouldn't be a sport. Yeah. The fact is that not everything that exists is for you, and that's okay. Yeah. Um. But back to my uh, closing questions. One, mm. what do you think Greta Gerwig was trying to achieve with this movie, and what was she trying to say? And two, what do you think the Barbie movie could add to the female male conversation? They're very loaded questions, aren't they? A lot to unpack. Answer them now. You said you need this to be a short podcast, <laughs> and I cannot possibly <laughs> answer those questions in a short time span. Well, just give me your best answer. Um, okay, it so what do I think she enough. was trying to achieve, and what do I think it can add to the dialogue between men and women? Yeah. Okay, and they's and them's, right? So, I don't necessarily... Look, look, at right? I'm a leftist, okay? The problem is, like, I'm always going to come from this from the skew of, right capitalism is the root of all evil right mm. okay so i'm gonna have a skew on this that of course greta gerwig has her ideologies that she wanted to you know get across and she wanted to do good with this movie but at the end of the day she's making massive money from this right Mattel is making massive money from this they're two white writers directors and like you want to go what you want to achieve money yeah. but the movie itself right so as i said i think it's a highlight on a social commentary on patriarchy in this cultural moment. I think we're on the cusp now of something big, of a big change in our world. And I think it is all to do with capitalism. It's all to do with patriarchy, right? I think what she was trying to do is highlight that. She was trying to highlight in this cultural moment that patriarchy affects everybody. It damages everybody. And the sooner we wake up to that, the better. And I think that's what it can add to the discussion. It's not an anti-men movie it's not about you sitting down and you as you said i don't know you said taking your lumps or whatever um Take, yeah. taking your medicine or whatever you yeah. said right so like that's not what this movie is about you go to a movie to enjoy a movie i mean emma was talking about like i don't think that deeply about movies i'm not saying you have to think deeply about every single movie right but there's there's a message to everything and that's why you're asking what can it add to the male female mm. conversation that they, you know the human conversation and that's it that we need to understand that patriarchy damages every single one of us and the sooner we realize that the sooner we can try and combat as best that as best we can right and that's it i think that's the biggest thing to take from it and i think she successfully did that but whether people are ready to hear that probably not i think there's a lot of bullshit right now and you're obviously all going to be in your own little echo chambers especially on your for you page on tiktok like it's going to serve you back what you believe but you're going to have to fight to get out of that like if you're in the ben shapiro if you're in the joe rogan area like if you're looking at pierce morgan get out of that and like something different and click on something different and get some new you know voices into your echo chamber to allow you to understand the patriarchy affects us all and on top of that capitalism affects us all and that's why i want to talk a little bit about the mattel there was a lot of pointing Sorry. going on <laughs> during that um a lot of pointing <laughs> and a lot of you need to fix this no that's um, not what i mean i'm just saying that like that's what i think she was trying to achieve that they were trying to achieve and i think they can do that but whether people are ready to listen to that i don't know yeah i think you know bottom line is this movie i said it on air on crc mm-hmm. fm 
It's not going to go down as my favorite movie of the year. It's not going to win any awards for its acting. It made a ton, a shit ton of mo- uh, money in the box office. And it's an I think it could win awards for its acting. America no, Ferrera and her, her monologue was unbelievable. Yeah. I think actually uh, Margot Robbie did some brilliant acting when she's talking to Rhea Perlman about becoming a human. I think that, that existential crisis in itself is beautiful and speaks to millennials in a way that hasn't in a long time like when she's doing the dance and she's like hey guys everything about dying i'm like oh wow girl i come to the movies to get away from my intrusive thoughts i don't want to be i don't want to be thinking about that right now Uh, well i'm not saying that the acting is bad don't Mm. get me wrong i'm just saying it might not be you know it might it might not i mean it's not an indie oscar where no like that's not what was written for no that doesn't mean that it isn't good no i'm not i'm not not saying that at all but what i'm saying is you know this movie it hits the notches it aims to hit mm-hmm. i think and but that's why i'm saying we got to pick up on our biases we've got to pick up on our little like our little internalized even myself internalized misogyny mm. that like because it's a barbie bit movie right you people could trivialize it a lot it's a barbie it's a it's a movie about girlhood right so it could be trivialized to the point where it's like oh well lizzo did the intro soundtrack and you know margot robbie's playing bobby barbie of course she is right so you know what i mean so we could trivialize it so much that we say, oh, well, you know, the dialogue was crap. Or, like, I see some people say these things. It's like, two things can be true, you know. The, the well, like, yeah. I, I enjoyed the acting, don't mm-hmm. get me wrong. I'm not mm-hmm. saying that the act, because it's a Barbie movie, the acting was crap. It's mm-hmm. anything but that, you know. Like I said, Ryan Gosling kind of stole the show yeah, when he was right. on there. You know, he was very comedic. The um, scene where she agrees to be his girlfriend, <laughs> and he goes back into the his casa as he Mojo, says dojo casa, yeah. casa uh, house. and um he goes sublime, <laughs> yeah, uh, sublime. and I it's just that. the comedic choices he made his were, were yeah were so good and margot robbie like in sm- like in small chunks like she's a great actress nonetheless yeah. but i feel like the hard-hitting acting came you know with the scenes with real Parliament and you know the scenes with america Ferrer. Yeah, and america Ferrer's monologue was great as well yeah but um, I just think there's other movies that might beat them out at the Oscars for. Come on, of course, yeah. like that's gonna be. But uh, overall, like it's definitely up for like I think it'll definitely win best production design. Um, that's a, I've and, seen some of the TikToks them making the. Yeah, <sighs> and I think on top of that, you know, Billy Eilish is definitely gonna get another award for her mm-hmm. part in the soundtrack. Yeah. And overall, as a soundtrack, it'll probably do well in mm-hmm. the um upcoming Oscars as well. I just think that um again, bottom line, if you're there's been a mass overreaction to the movie. Just Yeah, because of the cultural yeah. moment yeah. we're in, right? Yeah. Like even think about like I don't know, like the Supreme Court stuff, you know what I mean? Like mm. all the like think about Roe versus Wade being reversed. Think about like um, you know, the issue of abortion in the States at the minute. Like it's a ver- it's yeah. a time of a lot of tensions and that's to say the least, right? Yeah. So it's coming at this time where it's going to garner a lot of that, you know? Yeah. I think so. But overall you know the movie does well it hold i think it will hold up and mm. definitely you know those time and attention paid to this mm, movie for sure in a way that i don't think a lot of people expected yeah yeah leah thanks for joining me on this sorry for talking well, too you're, much you're sound <laughs> you're sound This brings the episode to a close. I hope you all enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to follow along with Is a Recording up on Spotify, Google Podcasts, Anchor FM, wherever you get your podcasts from. Make sure to give Is a Recording some love and follow along for future episodes. Thank you to both my guests, Leah and Emma, for coming on to review Barbie with me. I hope you enjoyed them. I certainly enjoyed having them on. For my next few episodes, I will be dedicating them to reviews of movies I've seen over the past few months. So we can look forward to deep, detailed reviews of Mission Impossible 7 and Indiana Jones. So you can look forward to that. Thank you again for tuning in. This is Kyle Duffy saying I'll see you next time. (laughs) 